Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight, the cryptids are waiting for you, so why not join us as we make our way to the middle of the woods. Get comfortable, and let the darkness take control. I love to share this story, because when I open with, I encountered a werewolf once, people are immediately intrigued by the absurdity of what I'm saying. These two stories happened almost a decade apart, and for obvious reasons I cannot guarantee they are related at all, but it seems reasonable to at least entertain the idea. The first story takes place at my cousin's trailer, a couple of houses down from mine. We live in a rural town at the foot of the Appalachian region, so there's plenty of forest coverage around us. We were playing hide and seek and all was well, until I tagged my cousin and made him the seeker. He hated seeking, so instead of playing the game he decided to sit and quit on his front porch. The time was around midnight, maybe a bit earlier so naturally it was pitch black, and perfect for scaring someone. My cousin's friend, my brother and I began to devise a plan to get revenge on my cousin for being a sore loser, and we came up with this. We were to lure him to the edge of the forest, and my brother was to jump out at him. A very simple plan for a couple of 13 year olds. So we got to it. We managed to convince him that there was something making a noise in the woods, and so he came with us to investigate. As we walked to the edge of the forest, we heard something inside walking with us. I looked at my cousin's friend, and we were both grinning, knowing it was my brother beyond those trees. Then out of nowhere, my brother bursts from the side of my cousin's trailer, screaming and roaring, sending all of us into a fearful panic. He got us good. So good, in fact, that we totally forgot about the noise coming from the forest that could no longer be attributed to my brother. As we were all laughing about the scare, we heard a horrifying noise coming from the depths behind us. It was a loud scream that sounded like a man screaming for help, and slowly changed pitch, and to this day I swear it said help. After about 5 seconds of human screaming sounds, it turned into the most guttural roar I've ever heard personally. It was chilling. We ran inside and my cousin opened the blinds to his windows, and it was right then we noticed the obvious and haunting sight of a full moon. Yes, we don't know what could have made that noise. Yes, there are farms around. It could have been a cow being attacked by coyotes, or pretty much anything that happens in rural America, but I've never heard anything like it before or since. Jump forward 9 years. I'm coming home late from work. As I'm driving I see two bright orange eyes peering at me from the side of the dark road. I thought it may have been a fox or a dog, but as I got closer I realised it was not your average fox or dog. It was a massive, black, wolf-like dog. The animal was so tall while on all fours that it seemed to be almost as big as my car. Its back legs were almost kangaroo-like very long and muscular looking while the front legs were short and thin. It dashed across the road and in front of my car, jumping the fence to the left with no struggle. When I got home I nonchalantly told my family that I finally got to see the werewolf that made the noise so many years ago. I don't necessarily believe that it's an actual werewolf, but I cannot honestly say it isn't. Anyway, I thought you guys might enjoy this story. Keep a keen eye out on Full Moon Nights. I should start by telling you a bit about myself. I'm a guy in my 20s, I'm 6 foot 4, I'm a vet, student, and train kickboxing. There isn't much that scares me, and people can regard me as an intimidating dude. My university is on top of a hill outside of town. From my dorm window on the 7th floor, I can see huge wheat fields in the nearby forest. My first encounter was last year. I have a German Shepherd called Hades, and a husky pup called Ragnar. That day, I left uni quite late. It was already dark outside. Usually I don't mind 
taking them out at night, as I can let them run without their leashes. They are trained, and I know they're going to listen to me. Besides, I know everyone knew them and wouldn't hurt them if they were left out. They have collars that light up since Hades is fully black and Ragnar is fully white, which makes it hard to see him during the winter, if I could see them all the time. We walked for a while and they were playing and running around, and at some point Hades stops and starts growling, looking into the wheat fields down the hill. I didn't think about it. There are bats, owls, and other critters around us. I leashed them, not wanting to run after them if they decided to go chase something. About half an hour of non-stop growling later, I'd had enough and decided to take Hades home and go out so that Ragnar can run a bit more. I got home and expected him to go into his cage. He likes sleeping there and I never lock it. But that night, all he did was stand at the window looking out. Since the pup was whining and wanting to go out again, I tried to drag Hades into the cage and lock him until I got back. Who knew? Maybe he might be trying to go out the window. I got a look, and on the parking lot, I saw a dark figure circling the cars. Thinking that it might be some local trying to steal something, I grabbed my flashlight and shone it at it. It wasn't a thief. In fact, I wouldn't say it was human at all. It looked up, eyes reflecting the light from the flashlight. It was black. Its head looked very similar to Hades. It was standing on all fours, but when I shone the light, it stood up. The roof of the cars barely reaching its midsection. It let out a growl, which I later learned that many of the tenants heard. Hades then went wild, trying to bust out the cage. Ragnar was whining ever louder. I realized he didn't want to go out. He was trying to get as far away from the window as possible. The growl made me flinch and I dropped the flashlight through the window. I tried to see it again, but it was too dark. I heard the crunching of snow as it left. The next morning, I went to find my flashlight and found huge dog-like footprints in the snow and a foul smell that still lingered. I borrowed infrared binoculars from a hunter friend of mine ever since, and I've seen it four times in the forest, twice crossing the field, and once it's come near the hill to look up. I and my roommate have been taking turns keeping watch at night when Hades starts growling. I don't take the dogs out at night, and Ragnar doesn't play and run around anymore. He just stays pressed against my feet. I hope he grows out of it. This story was told to me by a childhood friend's dad. Me and my friend had known each other for quite some time. Most of that time he lived in town. This town has a population of 8,000, literally in the dead center of Illinois. On the edge of town on a country highway, there's the remnants of a small pig farm and slaughterhouse, which is now run down. The land of which his family used to hunt on since the 80s. QR 8th grad year, and he tells me he's moving out to the country, to a new neighborhood that's being built upscale homes, and his dad's been promoted at the local power plant. This was a mile from the farm slash slaughterhouse. I start staying out at his house much more than usual, because it was awesome. Lots of money had gone into it. We would explore the woods during the day, and this was around 98 to 99, and we would spend the nights inside listening to music and messing around with Yahoo chat groups. One day out in the woods, we came across a pond of a decent size. There's a small island in the middle. My friend sees this and immediately goes pale, telling me we've got to leave. We hightail it out of there without waiting for me. And I follow. I keep asking what's going on, but he won't tell me. We finally return to his parents' house and are sitting in the kitchen when we come in through the garage. They see his face and ask him what's wrong. He tells his dad he found the pond. His dad looks sick and I again ask what the hell is going on? Now his dad is a pretty straight laced fellow, not really a sense of humor to speak of since I met him. I would only enjoy a glass of expensive whiskey when he was in the mood. He decides now is one of these moods. After getting his glass and taking a few sips, 
he makes us promise to stay away from there and tells us this story. When he was younger, his dad took him and his brother to hunt out there. This incident happened when he was 19 and well seasoned. They got out early and decided to set up by this pond. Slow day, only a few deer that weren't really worth anything. Starting to get the idea of a new spot, they heard a rustling from outside the pond across from them. It was a wolf, but those aren't here. Not a thing in our area, at least not capable of walking to the pond. Looking at it like it was investigating, then stood up on its hind legs, walked that way into the water, swam to the middle, but walked up to the island on two legs. And it stood there before lying down and seemingly fell asleep. They decided to wait to make sure it was out, then slowly backed away, getting back to the truck as quick as possible, never going to hunt back there again. Again, this was told to me quite some time ago, but it always stuck with me. My friend's dad never joked with us. He never seemed to have much of a sense of humor at all. Before I get to this story, I'd like to point out that I'm not from America, which is Surprisingly, in contrast of what people often think, I'm from the Netherlands, and due to the kind of mentality I was raised with, I would have never even dared to think about the existence of supernatural creatures here. Personally, I've always been on the fence about these kind of things, unsure what stories are legends and just superstitions, and which ones hold more truth than fantasy. The typical Dutch mentality I've been raised with is that there's nothing more to the world than what we've already discovered, at least not in terms of the divine, the paranormal and the supernatural. At least, that's what I had originally thought. But as it often does, the world tends to show us her truths in one form or another. I was born in Holland, the Midwest of the country, but moved to Brabant, the Middle South, at a young age. There's nothing out of the ordinary about my home, but I'm happy to say there's quite a big forest just a few kilometers south of where I live. I'd often, and still do, go on long walks and relaxing hikes there. I would often go off trail occasionally and go on nightly walks in the summer, all illegally, since here we have strict laws that say nobody is allowed to either camp, go off trail, or be in the forest at night. Needless to say, I deliberately stayed in the forest until after sunset, secretly risking a fine. I'd often wear dark clothes to go out into the forest so that the service men and women and the late night lurkers would be unable to spot me. I don't know why I'm addicted to these hikes in the forest, especially the nocturnal ones. I've always felt a really strong call of the wild since the first time I went off trail in the summer of 2017 when I'd visit the woods either going off trail or not. Not even the time of day would matter. I'd get energetic and excited about it. I would even dare to say that I wanted to go hunting at some point, when I'd see a deer or rabbit nearby. Unfortunately, I don't have a license or the weapons, so I'm pretty sure I wouldn't catch anything. Anyway, months ago at the start of autumn, I went for another night hike in the forest. I had to bring my flashlight since it was cloudy and rainy outside. As always, I went there on my mountain bike, chaining it to a pole before I'd set off into the darkness between the trees. I saw just the last people walking back to their cars and homes, as I was walking in the opposite direction. It was getting completely dark when I reached the middle point of the forest. You can call me a hippie, I don't mind. Frankly, I would have done so myself if I'd read a similar story. Now before I get to the actual encounter, I must say that I have already encountered something similar in the woods of January of 2017. I went to the forest during the day since the winter's first snow had fallen during the night, and I wanted to go and take some photographs of the beautiful snowy landscape. Though I stayed a bit too long, it had gotten dark, and I had to be back at my bike and out the woods. So hurrying back, is when I heard a loud crunch coming from the bushes, as if something big, like a deer, was running along the trees. The sound was distant at first, but soon it got closer, until indeed, I did see a deer, 
speed out of the snow, covered depths of the forest across the path I was on. Though, hot on its heels, raced something different. This huge, wolf-like creature, clearly bigger than a regular wolf. This one was at least a meter high at the shoulder. It looked slightly sturdier than a regular timber wolf, with dark, shaggy fur looking at its face. I could see its teeth and its paws. They were much larger to that of a normal wolf. Now please note that back in 2017, wolves were only just returning to the Netherlands, mostly roaming the border with Germany, and eventually settling in our biggest national park, which was located more than 100 kilometers away from my place. Plus, there hadn't been any wolves spotted in this area yet, so it was pretty much impossible for me to believe this was just an ordinary wolf. Only looking at the sheer size of it already. I would have taken a picture of it, if only I could have. Everything happened so fast, I saw the deer and the wolf cross the trail within a time span of 5 seconds at most, before they vanished into the dark. Still awestruck and a little unsettled by now, knowing there was a huge canine roaming the woods, I went over to look at possible tracks it might have left behind. It did. But with every gallop it must have kicked up lots of dirt in the air, since there were no paw prints, only claw marks, and then patches of dirt missing though those marks were still as big as my hand with my fingers spread out. Feeling frightened and still processing that I'd just seen a gigantic wolf hunt down its prey, I marched over to my bike as fast as I could, unlocked it, jumped on it, and rode away, before it decided to change its mind and make me its meal instead. That's when I heard a sinister deep howl coming from the woods. Like a wolf's howl, but in some way deeper, and more haunting. Of course I didn't tell anyone what I'd seen, especially since I didn't have enough evidence to support my claim. But I wasn't afraid of going back to the woods, not even at night, since I knew wolves generally aren't afraid of humans. And when I did go back, by the time of my second encounter, I'd almost forgotten about the beast that calls the forest its home. The summer of 2019, I returned for a nightly walk after having done the occasional hikes during the day. I didn't bring my camera with me this time, I just wanted to go for a refreshing full moon walk. After about half hour of walking deep into the woods, and after having set myself down on a wooden bench, I heard the faint bleating of a sheep from about 300 meters away. I stood up, and started to go in the direction of the noise, mostly because the bleating sounded rather distressed, as if the sheep were panicking, or trying to flee from something. I was already surprised that I could hear it from so far away, but what surprised me more was that I was able to smell something metallic as well. It was like a coppery scent, very strong, and that's when I figured it must be the smell of blood. The wind was blowing in my direction, but still I didn't know I was capable of this. The flock was placed on a small moor about 300 meters from where I was seated on the bench. It took me some time walking towards the pen before I could see the sheep, as they were hidden by trees and bushes. When I arrived at the pen, something unexpected shocked me. Not only were the animals running around frantically and trying to escape, but there had been two sheep slaughtered lying there in a puddle of blood, their throats torn open by powerful jaws and ferocious claws, judging from the looks of the deep gashes in the skin and bite marks on their neck. There were a scramble of enormous lupine paw prints around the sheep's corpses, and around their makeshift enclosure. It seemed as if the killer was meticulous about choosing its prey before stepping inside to make a move. After the victims had been selected, the results were clear to see. This monstrous beast threw caution to the wind, just as it had done to the sheep's innards. To most, it was a horrendous sight, but I found it more curious than anything else. The first thing I felt was frustration, that something was roaming around the woods near my home. I followed the tracks, hoping to find what made them, before whatever it was found me. As I got deeper into the woods, the foliage became denser and harder to navigate. It was just that dark. 
Thinking quickly, I turned on my flashlight and shone it around the shadows cast by the moonlight, creating eerie shapes and figures. Suddenly, I heard muffled footsteps from around me. A branch snapped from behind me and without thinking I shone my light towards where I'd heard it. Dark yellow eyes about four feet above the ground reflected back at me from the shadows. As soon as the beast had stepped out from the cover of the shadows, and when I came face to face with it, I froze. It was, from a few quick looks of it, the same animal I had seen two and a half years ago. It had the same build, the same dark shaggy fur. The animal appeared to be staring at me cautiously, its gaze hard and cold, but it didn't seem to be aggressive. From the blood on its snout, I could tell that this must have been the beast that killed those sheep, and now I was indeed scared, on the edge, and cautious. It's not like I stood much of a chance against a wolf like this, with its huge teeth and claws, but my instincts told me to fight rather than flee if need be. After all, if I ran, I'd pretty much give myself away as prey for the animal if it was still hungry. Plus, these woods were mine, and the beast was an intruder, and I'd be damned if I let an intruder trespass on my home. The beast was still watching me, and as it did so, it rose onto its hind legs. Thankfully, no signs of aggression were visible. Despite that, I took a defensive stance, broadening my shoulders and appearing as big as I possibly could. The creature approached. It was now standing about five meters away and I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand as it bowed forward a little, sniffing the air. It then perked up its ears, twitched them about, as if it was reconsidering going after me. And despite how standoffish I chose to appear, and how I may act in my day-to-day -day life, I couldn't even come close to how intimidating and well-built this thing was, how large it was, and when compared to, well, how minuscule I am. I shrank inside. The wolf stepped back, breaking eye contact as it sniffed the air and looked around. I took a tiny step forward, attempting to scare it off, as I once again tried to look as defensive and territorial as I felt in that moment. I decided to take my chances. It was now or never, so breathing in deeply and with my most intimidating voice, I shouted, Get out now. In Dutch, of course. The beast acted surprised, startled even, as if it hadn't even expected me to speak or be this defensive. It then let out a growl, and after that it got down on all fours and vanished into the foliage. Soon as I could no longer see or hear it, I let out a sigh of relief so loud that I was still afraid. That thing could hear me, and worse, it could return. My feet had gone numb as the adrenaline left my body, and I was quaking as the cold air finally started to nip at me. A loud, distant howl echoed from behind me, and as it rang through the night, the fear grew inside me. It howled again, and I started to head back to my bike, swiftly jogging for what seemed like hours, continuously checking every sound I heard, keeping my eyes wide open, like a startled deer, and never failing to look around me in case the monster had other plans. After making it back to my bike, I quickly unlocked it and raced home, breaking what must have been the world's record for fastest speed pedaled, and once I arrived, the realization hit me, that I had very likely been staring death in the face. It made yet another cold shiver go down my spine. To relax, I had a drink, sat down on the couch, and as I sat down with a drink in hand, staring into the fireplace, the question started pouring at me. Why didn't it attack me? Why did it leave? Stranger still, how is something that big? Not to mention how it hasn't been reported in the local news. How has no one caught it on camera? And if they have, were they silenced by the media? Were they laughed at, mocked, ostracized? I had all these questions, but no way of finding any answers. Moreover, was it even what I thought it was? Was the creature perhaps a dire wolf of some kind? It was only thought to have gone extinct in prehistoric times. 
There had to be a logical explanation after all. Time moved on, weeks became months, and I never told a soul about my encounter. Since then, cattle mutilations have been reported. Strange and large animal tracks have been documented. People say it's a bear or a ravenous pack of wolves. But these stories only come up the night after a full moon, they say. There have even been multiple reportings of sheep massacres around the south and east of the country that have been confirmed to have been committed by a wolf. I've been back to these woods since, but only in the day. But even then, I still felt off, like I was being watched and unwelcome. My two encounters did make me dive into Dutch and European folktales and legends about werewolves. And to summarize what I found, European timber wolves are said to have been the most bold and aggressive in the world. All I can say for certain is that no matter how unbelievable it sounds, always give a little bit of trust towards the old stories you're told, because you may just be encountering something straight out of fantasy, only to leave your survival, your life to fate. And if you should ever find yourself in the Netherlands, especially in the woods on a full moon at light, you best hope that thing you hear howling off in the distance is a lot further than you think to be, because there's no telling what might happen if the two of you meet. Good luck and have a good night. I was 22 when this happened, two years ago. My name's Grisha. And for the past five or six years, I've only had two friends who have stuck around with me through thick and thin. We live within five minutes of each other in a rural area in Southwest Ohio, specifically in the hills of the Ohio River Valley. My friends are called Garrett and Oscar, and my brother, who is part of our friend group, is called Chris. Garrett and Oscar are actually next door neighbors. They both live on decently sized plots of land that they don't actually own. There's lots of farmland and thick forest, and behind Garrett's house are a few small ponds that we used to fish in. His house was pretty small and not in the best condition, and Oscar lived in a medium-sized brick house. We would usually go to Oscar's place to hang out during summer, since his parents were always at camp, and Garrett's house or my house during the other seasons. This is somewhat relevant, but mostly for setup. Like I said, this happened about two years ago. Now, one thing you need to know about us is that we are firearm enthusiasts. So when one of my buddies called me and told me he brought a new rifle, I knew we were gonna go shooting before the day was over. I grabbed my own firearms as did Chris, we jumped in the Jeep and drove over to Oscar's house. It was still early, about three in the afternoon, and less than five minutes after we'd pulled in, a black Chevy Impala pulled into the driveway, heralding Garrett's arrival. He bought his rifle and pistol as well. We shot for a few hours, taking pot shots at wooden targets Oscar had built in his backyard, and we'd burnt through a pretty large chunk of ammo. I decided I wanted to get something to drink, so I jumped in the Jeep and drove for about 10 minutes to the closest gas station. After getting to the gas station and grabbing a few cans of the Nectar of the Gods, by which of course I mean Monster, I headed back to my friend's house. When I came back, I saw all three of them standing by the door at the side of the house. Oscar had a very uneasy look on his face. We jumped out the Jeep and walked over and asked him what was going on. We heard some weird stuff in the woods a few minutes ago, Garrett told me. I asked him what he was talking about, and what he meant by weird stuff. They began to explain that they heard some sort of loud vocalization that sounded between a coyote's yelping and a howl. None of us had any idea what it could have been, so we opted to forget about it. We went inside and decided to play some games, and after a few hours I became bored and started browsing 4chan on my phone and lost track of time. It was getting late. Garrett had walked outside to smoke a cigarette. Oscar was in the toilet, and Chris's girlfriend came and collected him. Oscar's dog started to bark all of a sudden, and it startled me. I heard Garrett coming back inside the house rather quickly and asked him what was going on, and if something was wrong. Step outside and check for yourself, he told me. 
I came out curious about what the dogs were barking at, and the second I opened the door the smell hit me. It was the worst smell I'd ever smelt in my life. Imagine the smell of a wet dog, the smell of a dead deer rotting in the sun, and the smell of landfill. Combined. That's the best way I can describe it. Repulsed by the stench, I went back inside and told Garrett I can see why he came in so quickly. The dogs were barking, and they appeared to be getting more aggressive. When Oscar finally came out the bathroom, wondering what the commotion was about, Garrett explained the smell, and Oscar seemed more curious than anything. He was also angry, thinking someone was trespassing. He grabbed his firearms and walked out to look around. He told us to stay inside until he returned. Not thinking much of it, we agreed and I began browsing 4chan. I was startled when I heard the sound of a dog yelp, followed by five shots in rapid succession. A few minutes later, Oscar burst through the door, instructed us to grab our own firearms, and that there's some tall dude in a ghillie suit that just ended the life of one of his dogs. We grabbed our firearms and followed him outside, staying close the entire time. Sure enough, in the backyard, we found one of his dogs. The throat was ripped. This wasn't a small dog either, it was a large poodle mix of some kind, one of the really big ones. Close by, we saw the other dog cowering in his house. The cows in the pasture on the other side of the road were mooing as if they were both afraid and agitated, and I asked Oscar to explain what was going on. And he told me that on the other side of the barn, where he heard the dog yelp, he rounded the corner and saw a figure that looked like a big guy in a ghillie suit running towards the woods. He shot at him, hoping to hit his leg and incapacitate him, but he knew he didn't. The same smell he described earlier was hanging in the air, but it was faint. Garrett and Oscar had flashlights on their rifles, and I had one on my pistol, so I slung my rifle over my back, drew my pistol, and we fanned out to search the area. I wasn't expecting to find anything. I could see Garrett heading to the other edge of the property, and Oscar was moving towards the cow pasture. I headed back towards the barn, and as I started to step in, I lit a cigarette, when I felt raindrops hit me. I stepped into the barn to smoke, stood there for under a minute when I heard another shot coming from the direction Garrett went. I started going that way and saw Oscar heading there too. While we were making our way, Garrett fired three more shots. What are you shooting at? I asked. I saw the dude, but... Oscar's voice was shaky and hushed. It didn't look like a guy. Garrett took a heavy gulp and continued to explain. It looked like a big dog or a wolf. I could clearly see its muzzle and ears, and I saw it standing behind some bushes, but it was on its hind legs. He stopped, pulled out a cigarette, hands quivering, but still managed to light it. I reckon it must have been about six feet tall, he went on to say. What are you even talking about? You know there aren't any wolves around here, and coyotes aren't that big. You think a coyote would have had the guts to come up and rip my dog's throat? We've got to be dealing with some pelt-wearing hermit strung out on meth or something. My friend went on to explain, he sized up the height by taking reference to a nearby tree that was about 350-ish feet away. So we all walked over to see what he was talking about, and then the rain started to pick up, and the wind was getting strong as well. The clap of thunder put us all on edge, and sure enough, once we reached the tree, which was a large maple, the branch he used to determine the size was close to eight feet off the ground by our estimate. We decided to put the other dog in the garage and keep it safe from whoever or whatever was messing with us. The dog was inside a small kennel, but if you live in a rural area, you know that junkies always manage to find their way to break into places they shouldn't be. We all went back to the house, locked the dog in, and stayed there. Should we just leave? We can just crash at Grisha's house until morning, Garrett said. I reminded him that Chris and his girlfriend were there, and his face instantly turned to one of disgust. We all hated Chris's girlfriend because she was really annoying, and none of us wanted to deal with her. 
So we unanimously decided to hunker down with our weapons and stay awake on shifts. It was past midnight at this point and I volunteered to take first shift until around 2am, while the other two lads passed out. I sat there watching the window and became bored after the adrenaline wore off. I reached into my backpack and pulled out a finely crafted Gurkha cigar and stepped out on the back porch, lit it and began to unwind. I stood there for about 10 minutes when I heard the cows begin to make more noise and I could hear the other dog barking aggressively inside the garage. I became on edge again and sat my cigar in the ashtray and unslung my rifle and held it on with the safety off. I made sure not to stray too far from the porch light, but I got far enough into the field to see movement in the tree line. I couldn't see what it was, but in a gap in the trees and undergrowth, I saw quick flashes of a gray figure. I began feeling uneasy. So I started backing to the house. I could hear rustling over the breeze. It sounded like it was moving towards me and I pointed my rifle in that direction. I had 10 shots to defend myself before I would reach for my pistol if something were happening. The rustling stopped. I still couldn't see anything. I was around halfway between the porch and the tree line and time just felt like it stopped. I felt like I was standing there for hours. I turned and ran, hearing something burst out of the undergrowth behind me. I reached the back door, threw it open, struggling to catch my breath due to years of smoking. Garrett and Oscar had woken up. Garrett's shift started soon, and I told them about what happened, and they told me to go lie down for a bit. When I woke up, we would all sit up until sunrise. I lay down on the couch and managed to somehow doze off, and was awoken not long after by Garrett shaking me. We've got to go now, he said in a panicked tone. Oscar went outside half hour ago and he still isn't back yet. I was still half asleep, so it took a moment to sink in. Oscar's gone? I asked, trying to make sense of what I was hearing. I sat up and asked him to explain. We heard the cows outside acting annoyed, but then they started to sound like they were scared and some of them managed to trample through the fence. Oscar went to see what scared them and told me that if he wasn't back in tent to call the cops. By now I was lacing my boots up. Forget that, I said. Oscar's a brother. We can't just leave him out there. We're going to go find him. I agreed without hesitation. We grabbed all our arsenal and headed out, locked the door behind us, and I could see the spot in the fence where the cows had broken through. We crossed the road and walked into the pasture. This pasture is huge. Part of it is just grass, but it also has small ponds, but most of it is a forest. Flat forest. The kind with not much undergrowth and where the trees are spaced out more. A great place for cattle and a great place to hunt too. If I had to guess, I would say at least 200 acres. Garrett used to hunt on this farmer's land too. He was leading the way when we heard a long string of rapid fire, followed by a short pause, followed by nine more shots. It was clearly Oscar emptying out his arm grabbing his pistol and emptying it out too. We ran in that direction, even though it sounded far away. And we reached the wooded part of the property and called Oscar's name. We kept making our way to the direction we heard the shots and panic began to set in with each passing moment. Garrett was losing his call and I wasn't far behind. He suddenly fired off a shot and began sprinting. There he is, that's gotta be him, he was yelling. I gave chase, but was having trouble keeping up. Slow down, I yelled, trying to get him to listen. We need to stick together. But he didn't listen. His light was bobbing back and forth as he ran and I continued to follow. I slipped in a pile of mud and got it all in my mouth. I looked up just as I was regaining my bearings. When I looked up, I saw a silhouette standing 50 feet away. It looked like a large German shepherd on its back legs. Its ears were pointing up and its muzzle. It looked like it was pointing in a different direction. I looked down and saw it didn't have front legs, but what looked like arms with hands and fingers tipped with claws. It seemed to be covered in gray matted fur, but what stood out the most were its piercing yellow eyes. 
I saw it run off in the direction Garrett was going so I quickly stood up and gave chase. If Garrett was in danger I had to do something and I ran and I started to hit gunshots and eventually saw Garrett's light in the distance. He stopped shooting and I saw the light point at the ground like he was reloading. I called up and asked him if he saw it. He looked over and noticed Oscar on the ground his back against a tree and asked if he was okay. He's just unconscious, he replied. We gotta take him home. We both picked him up, slung an arm around our shoulders and made our way back to the house. We felt, we knew, should I say, we were being watched. We could hear movement when we moved and it stopped when we stopped. I drew my pistol with my free hand and switched on the light attached to it. My eyes stung as sweat made its way inside. Garrett and I were both out of breath and we still had quite a long way to go. After walking for about 20 minutes, Oscar awoke. We stopped to ask him what happened and he started to explain things to me, but was cut off by the sound of a branch snapping. Garrett and I both trained our lights in that direction and saw the now familiar flash of grey just at the edge of the light. I turned in that direction and fired three shots. We heard a growl and the sound of something big running away and we then booked it. If I had kept track of time and the direction as well, we should have broken out of the tree line in 10 minutes and then see the light from the house. Fortunately, I was right. We ran through the pasture, made it to the fence, crossed the street, and I asked Oscar to unlock the door. He couldn't find the keys. So we tried the window. We went to the back of the house and managed to remove the AC from a window, which Oscar then climbed through. He let us in and the rest of the night was uneventful. The next day we talked to the owner of the pasture. He found three of his cows dead and partially eaten. He also found a trail of blood into the wooded area that led towards the house and then the opposite direction to the edge of his property. He also found Oscar's keys on the ground where he'd been knocked out and where we found him. The farmer explained the blood trail led to the land owned by an old hermit who lives in a trailer in the woods. He apparently never leaves and has relatives bring him food and is rumored to have messed with the occult in his younger days. We told the farmer everything, but he didn't believe us, thinking we saw a pack of rabid coyotes or feral dogs. So what could it have been? Was it a wolf-like cryptid? A werewolf? A dogman? My friend still lives in the same house and he hasn't seen or heard anything since. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. I do hope that you enjoyed tonight's cryptid stories. I do very much like cryptid stories. Dogman, werewolves, whatever you thought they were. I do hope that you enjoyed. Oh, I've got my laptop back. That is what I am working on and it is, even though it's not as fast as my wife's old machine, everything's on here and uh, it's just good to work with, you know, familiarity. Yeah, apparently the, uh, the fan was just really, really dirty. It didn't need to be replaced. So, you know, saves a little bit of money, which is good. Um, and yeah, it's working fine now. So I'm really happy that my little machine is back. And you know, I've got to say, the, my wife's other computer is good, but the fan makes a lot more noise. For those of you wearing earphones, you might be able to tell the difference as this lovely little Acer hardly makes any noise on the fan, which is something I've always really liked about it. Perfect for recording because it's very noiseless. All right then guys, I think I'm gonna sign off here. Stay awesome and I'll see you in the next one.